Coming up on this Thursday edition of Daybreak, Korea's foreign minister pours cold water on speculation the leaders of Korea and Japan could meet soon. He says Seoul is still waiting for an apology from Tokyo for its historical wrongdoings. Pro-democracy protesters in Hong Kong say they are prepared to occupy several key government buildings if the city-state's leader does not step down by this Thursday. Plus, one of Asia's biggest film festivals, the Busan International Film Festival, kicks off this evening for a 10-day run. Daybreak begins now. Hello and thanks for joining us to our viewers around the world. It's 6am on Thursday, October 2nd here in Seoul, South Korea. I'm Mark Broom and you're tuned in to Daybreak. And we start with the latest prospects of a meeting between President Park Geun-hye and Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe. Korea's Foreign Minister invoked some weather terms to describe the probability of the leaders holding their first one-on-one -on -one meeting as cloudy with a chance for sun but only if Tokyo sincerely admits to and atones for its historical wrongdoings. Our Hwang Sung-hee starts us off. The forecast for a summit between President Park Geun-hye and Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe this year is cloudy. In an interview with Korean radio station CBS on Wednesday, Foreign Minister Yoon Byung has said a show of Japanese sincerity over historical issues remains a precondition to summit talks. He added that resolving the urgent issue of Japan's wartime sexual enslavement of Korean women would be a good place to start. Yoon said measures that can be accepted by the 55 former sex slaves still alive and the international community would be regarded as measures of sincerity. His remarks follow a string of meetings between the two countries this month. Yoon held private talks with Japanese ambassador to Korea Koro Betsho for the first time while President Park welcomed former Japanese Prime Minister Yoshiro Mori, who brought a personal letter from Abe. The vice foreign ministers from Korea and Japan met in Tokyo Wednesday for their first strategic dialogue since President Park took office in February of 2013. The frequent diplomatic exchanges raised speculation that the two neighbors were preparing for what would be the first summit between their leaders with November's APEC summit in Beijing as the likely stage. But President Park remains adamant she will not meet with Abe until he apologizes for Tokyo's wartime atrocities. As the two sides remain wide apart on the comfort women issue, the Korean foreign minister said it will likely be some time before the sun shines again. Hwang Sang-hee, Arirang News. Now, North Korea is believed to have carried out yet another test of its intercontinental ballistic missile, the KN-08. U.S.-based think tank 38 North says uh, satellite imagery shows the missile's first stage engine was tested in early August at the Sohei launch site in North Korea's northwest. This adds to a series of engine tests Pyongyang has been carrying out since last year. Security experts say with the continued tests, North Korea may be moving on to possible full-scale tests of the KN-08 in the future. You can see the missile there. This missile is believed to have a range of at least 5,500 kilometers, which means the U.S. state of Alaska is within its range. Now, Russia has admitted it may take quite a lot of time, but it still thinks the multilateral talks on North Korea's nuclear program, which have been sat dormant for six years now, may resume at some point in the future, meeting with his visiting North Korean counterpart in Moscow on Wednesday. Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov said resuming the so-called six-party talks would be complicated, but not hopeless. The Russian official added that unsettled issues could negatively impact relations between the two countries and pose a threat to regional stability as well. Lavrov also called on all related parties to take 
what he said should be a balanced approach and refrain from taking abrupt steps that polarize positions. The two Koreas, the US, China, Japan and Russia began the six party talks back in 2003 with the aim of eventually denuclearizing Pyongyang but they uh, were suspended in 2008 after North Korea launched a ballistic missile. Now South Korean President Park Geun-hye said a big thank you to the country's soldiers on Wednesday as South Korea marked its annual Armed Forces Day. She also reminded them that the military should play a role in laying the foundation for peaceful unification of the Korean Peninsula. Our Son Jung-in reports. South Korea staged a massive ceremony on Wednesday to honor the military on its 66th Armed Forces Day. At the military headquarters in Daejeon, President Park Geun-hye started her speech by describing the current security situation on the Korean Peninsula. She said the North had been raising tensions in the region while pursuing the development of its nuclear weapon and missile programs. She then urged Pyongyang to join Seoul's efforts to build trust and lay the groundwork for the potential unification of the divided Korean Peninsula. President Park also said the North's human rights violations should be addressed, an issue she placed emphasis on recently at the UN General Assembly. She added that this must start with South Korea's military, which should lead as a role model of human rights. She also urged the military to look inward, referring to a series of deaths blamed on bullying, harassment and assaults of junior enlisted soldiers by their seniors in barracks. President Park stressed that love and trust of the people is important for making a strong military and promised to do her utmost to improve the welfare of soldiers and their service environment. Son Jung-in, Arirang News. Now, the U.S. government says it's holding consultations with Seoul on the possibility of deploying a U.S. anti-missile defense shield known as THAAD right here in South Korea. Now, remarks by a top U.S. defense official clearly contradict statements made by the South Korean government on this highly sensitive issue. Our Connie Kim reports. Seoul and Washington are at odds over whether the two will station a U.S. anti-missile defense shield in South Korea to deter any possible nuclear attacks from North Korea. The latest from South Korea is that no consultations have taken place between Seoul and Washington over the deployment of a missile battery in the South. The statement from Seoul's defense ministry was in response to comments from U.S. Deputy Secretary of Defense Robert Work, who said at a recent forum that there had been discussions on setting up a terminal high-altitude area defense or that system to deter North Korea's missile threats. We are considering very carefully uh, whether or not to put a THAAD in South Korea. We're doing site surveys. We're working with the government of uh, South Korea now to determine if that is the uh, right thing to do. The THAAD missile defense system can strike down medium and intermediate range ballistic missiles in midair. Deputy Secretary Work underscored that the system, while complicated to set up, would become an important part of regional defense. One THAAD battery was deployed to Guam last year. The senior U.S. official also noted that Washington is well aware of the possible backlash involved in deploying the system in South Korea. Uh, we've emphasized to both China and to uh, uh, Russia that these are not strategic anti-ballistic missiles, uh, that they essentially allow, I mean, they're essentially designed to address regional threats. Washington has been considering stationing the U.S. anti-missile defense shield since 2011. The idea of a deployment has some word in Seoul that it could be an attempt from Washington to get other Asian allies to join its missile defense system. The two countries are expected to hold consultations over stationing the U.S.-designed defense system at the upcoming security consultative meeting in Washington this month. Connie Kim, Adirang News.
Well, now it's time for a look through the global headlines we're following on this Thursday morning. For that, we turn to our Eunice Kim standing by at the News Centre. Good morning, Eunice. Good morning to you, Mark. Pressure is mounting and patience thinning in the massive pro-democracy demonstrations in Hong Kong, with student leaders threatening to occupy government buildings if Hong Kong's embattled chief executive does not resign within 24 hours. The ultimatum was officially issued on Wednesday. Lester Shum of the Hong Kong Federation of Students told the Associated Press there was no room for a dialogue with Chief Executive C. Y. Leung because he had ordered tear gas on protesters over the weekend. Leung had previously rejected a call to address the swelling crowds. There is concern that police aggression could step up again if indeed demonstrators storm government buildings. This as in China, the Communist Party run People's Daily warned of unimaginable consequences should the protests persist as state-run TV in Hong Kong declared residents should support decisive police enforcement meant to restore social order as soon as possible. In Washington, Secretary of State John Kerry reiterated U.S. support for the, quote, highest possible degree of autonomy for Hong Kongers, to which his Chinese counterpart, Minister Wang Yi, replied the protests are China's internal affairs and that no country would allow illegal acts against order. The volcanic eruption of Japan's Mount Ontake has claimed the deadliest toll in 90 years. Nagano police said the death toll from Saturday's blast rose to 47 as rescue workers resumed their search Wednesday despite the risk of another eruption. Some 1,000 troops, police and firefighters wore surgical masks and carried toxicity measuring devices as they canvassed the volcano amid ash and gas spewing from the crater. Helicopters brought bodies down from the three-kilometer high peak. Special cutting machines were used to free bodies stuck between rocks. Others were buried in ash. A second person is being monitored for an Ebola infection in the United States, according to officials. The director of Dallas County's health department said Wednesday that the suspected case was someone who was in close contact with the man diagnosed with Ebola, identified as Thomas Eric Duncan. The U.S. Centers for Disease Control had announced yesterday of America's first Ebola case. A team of nine federal health officials are tracking others who may have come in contact with him some 12 to 18 people are being monitored for exposure, including three members of the ambulance crew that transported him to the hospital and five school children. And airstrikes continue on Islamic State militants fighting Kurdish fighters around the northern Syria border town of Kobani. Activists on the ground said at least 10 people were killed overnight as jihadists closed into within two to three kilometers of that town. The persisting struggle comes as Turkey is signaling a possible deployment of troops into Syria or Iraq. Its government sent a proposal to parliament that would broaden powers to allow military action against terrorist groups in that region. We start before the sun rises to bring you the latest stories out of Korea. We also lead the way with important global coverage. Stay on the pulse of what is happening with Daybreak. Uh, now, in uh, some uh, economic news, Korea's exports picked up in September thanks to a boost in demand from the U.S. and China. Trade volume, the total amount of goods coming in and going out of Korea, may reach a record high by the end of this year. However, increasingly unfavorable currency conditions are going to make it much more difficult for the nation's exporters next year. Our Kim ji reports. Despite the appreciation of the Korean currency, the country's exports edged up in September and is expected to replace its yearly high by the end of this year. Outbound shipments rose about 7 percent on year to nearly 48 billion U.S. dollars. Strong performance figures in steel and computers led the gains, rebounding from a contraction in August. 
Outbound shipments to the U.S. were up nearly 20 percent, buoyed by signs of recovery in American jobs and consumer spending in August. Exports to China also went up in five months on strong demand for solid-state computer memory, which are faster and more reliable than traditional hard drives. With this pace, the trade ministry says exports will exceed its record high by the end of this year, reaching $1.1 trillion on the back of increased shipments of semiconductors and automobiles. But an economist from Hyundai Research Institute says it will be a different story next year as the weakening of the Japanese yen against the strengthening Korean won fully takes effect. Normally, it takes up to a year and a half for the changes in the exchange rate to noticeably take effect on market prices. Due to the weakening of the yen, the payability of Japanese exporters are improving. So they're expected to lower their unit prices for products like automobiles and steel while steadily increasing their supply. The appreciation of the Korea won against the Japanese yen first became evident in the second half of 2012, largely due to the expansionary monetary policy taken by Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe. The current exchange rate of roughly 968 won to 100 yen is the lowest it's been since 2008. Kim Jeong, Arirang News. Now, big news in Korea's tech world. A new giant in the country's internet service industry begins its first full day in operation on this Thursday. Daom Kakao is the result of two of Korea's dominant internet players, one from the, the PC era, one from the mobile era, getting in bed with one another. Oh, Hang Jie reports. It's official. Taum Kakao, born through the merger of Korea's second largest internet portal operator Taum and the country's biggest messaging application firm Kakao Talk, launched business on Wednesday. The new tech giant aims to become a mobile life platform leader based on Kakao's 37 million users and Taum's contents. Our key business strategy is connecting people to people people and information, online and offline businesses, and people and objects. Taum and Kakao have been preparing to launch a united entity since May this year when they announced their merger. Kakao has been diversifying its business portfolio, introducing services like Bank Wallet Kakao, a mobile platform that provides small sum financial transactions and mobile payments. Taum has been focusing on its role as a search engine, launching specialized services for better search results. The merger will create the biggest company on the country's tech-heavy COSDAQ once it's listed in mid-October, with the entity's market cap expected to reach 10 trillion won, or roughly 9.5 billion U.S. dollars. But analysts say the listing on the COSDAQ marks only the beginning. Right after Taum Kakao is listed on the country's secondary bourse, investors will ask the company to shift toward the main bourse. COSDAQ is an entry market for newcomers, not for already huge companies like Taum Kakao. The merger points to a shift in Korea's internet portal dynamics, currently led by the country's top portal operator, Naver which takes up 80 percent of the domestic market share. Hwang Jie, Arirang News. Now, it's almost that time of the year when the eyes of Asia's movie-making industry settle on a city in southern Korea, the Busan International Film Festival opens its doors this Thursday evening and will run for roughly one week and a half. Park ji reports. Preparations are ongoing at the Busan Cinema Center, the main venue of the annual film festival, to greet dozens of film stars and film lovers from all over the world. Now in its 19th installment, this year's Busan International Film Festival opens this Thursday evening. 314 films from nearly 80 countries will be shown at seven theaters in this southern harbor city throughout the 10-day event. To celebrate this year's grand opening, an eve celebration took place Wednesday at Biff Square in Namporong, the birthplace of the festival back in 1996. I sincerely congratulate the opening of the 19th BIFF. Please support our film, The Tenor Lyrico Spinto. 
I came to celebrate the opening of the Busan International Film Festival. I'm very happy to be here. As a Busan resident, I'm proud to see this international film festival being held in the city, and I wish it many more successful years to come. Taiwanese film director Tu Jie News international premiere, Paradise in Service, will open the festival. Hong Kong director Yi Po Chung's comedy and melodrama, Gangster Payday, will be the festival's closing film. Park Ji Won, Arirang News, Busan. And a good Thursday morning to you all as we continue on with our 2014 Incheon Asian Games coverage, starting off with some notable gold medal finishes, one of which was the South Korean women's handball team and their first gold medal in eight years. Now, the South Korean women's handball team are known as the powerhouses and the sport won five straight Asian Games gold starting in 1986 before losing to Japan in the 2010 Asian Games. But it was payback time as the South Korean national team dominated the offense and the defense, beating Japan 29-19 to reclaim their Asian Games gold. Meanwhile, over in the women's hockey final, the South Korea women's team finally claimed their first Asian Games gold in 16 years, as Kim Dae scores the lone goal in the third quarter as they defeat China 1-0. And now moving over to rhythmic gymnastics with Son Yun Jin, her first day of competitions on Wednesday. Now the rhythmic gymnast went into her preliminary group competition, followed by her team competition. Now first off, over on the team competition, the team of Son Yun Jin, Lee Dae, Kim Yoon Hee, and Lee Na Kyung were able to score a combined 164.046 points from the four apparatus routines to finish second behind Uzbekistan for their first silver medal finish. Meanwhile, over on the Group B preliminary competition, Sonia and Jeff finished first in all four routines, finishing with 53.882 points, and the score beats her rival Den Sung Wei's Group A preliminary score of 52.883, as the South Korean rhythmic gymnast hopes to win Korea's first ever gold medal later tonight. And moving on, South Korea saw its first ever silver medal finish, this time over in the 50-kilometer race wall competition, as Park Chil Sung finished second in the race. Now, with the nation having only won silver and bronze in the 20-kilometer competitions in the past, the first ever silver medal in the 50-kilometer race wall competition was won by Park Chil Sung after coming in at a final time of 3 hours, 49 minutes, and 15 seconds. And to make it even more special, the silver medal finish was his first ever medal in the Asian Games competitions. And another special silver medal finish for Korea, this time over in the women's lightweight competition in boxing. With 25-year-old Park Ji Na facing off with China's Yin Jun Hua in the final fight, the fight goes to decisions where the South Korean lost 0-2 and finished with a silver medal. Despite the loss, it was Korea's first ever silver medal in the event as well. Meanwhile, during the medal ceremony, India's Lashram Sarita Devi, who lost to Park in the semifinals match, gave her a bronze medal to the South Korean in protest, citing that she disagrees with the judge's decision. Meanwhile, India's protest has been rejected by the boxing jury at the Asian Games. Now, South Korea did add a number of late gold medals on Wednesday, including the three gold medals in Taekwondo and a few more over in Greco-Roman wrestling. So before I say goodbye, let's take a look at the current medal count at the Incheon Asian Games after 13 days of competitions. And I'll see you guys again for your sports needs. Good morning. Uh, today looks to be cloudy or could be sunny or rainy. Well, for here in the upper parts, we'll wake up to mostly uh, cloudy skies. Then we'll see showers falling at around noon. Uh, precipitation of 5 to 10 millimeters are expected, so it shouldn't rain that much. But that rain will usher in cooler air today, so temperatures will end up only in the low 20s. 20s. And speaking of which, the autumn rain is only going to drag down the temperatures from now on, so it's only going to get cooler from now on as well. So on that note, here are the readings for today. Low in Seoul started out at 17, then daytime highs in the capital will be only 20, while Taegu will rise to 23, and Gwangju and Busan will make it to 25 
this afternoon. Now for other regions, Jeju Island and Taejung will see highs of 24 and 23, while Dokdo peaks at 21. Now over in Incheon, where the Asian Games are being held, we'll also have a rainy and cool day today, with highs only peaking to 20 later in the day. That's all for me at this hour, and back to you, Mark, in the studio. Thank you very much, Gion, and that's going to do it uh, from us for now at least. Korea Today is coming up at the top of the hour at 7 a.m. Korea time. Have a fabulous day. Thanks for watching. Goodbye.